So let's talk about a, some of the specifics here. So I wanted to go to one that I think we disagree on, oh, but okay. I, want you to, I want you to make the most compelling case that okay. you can, uh, this open borders stuff. Yes, so you're, okay. not, you're not a... I'm, no I'm not an open borders guy. This okay. is a, I'm, I'm not a crazy borders person, or whatever that means. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think there should be no immigration. We are yeah. a nation of immigrants. Uh, that's what's made this melting pot, I think, the greatest nation in the history of the world. It's given more freedom to more people than, than anyone ever. Um, but the open border situation, especially now in 2018, 2018 strikes me as particularly tenuous, but take it away. Yeah, good. So I, I think one thing to keep in mind is what exactly uh, an advocate of open borders is arguing for. So I think most, so open borders is maybe a bit of a misnomer. It's more light borders or porous borders or something like that. Where So the idea wouldn't be that there's perhaps no checkpoints or uh, no restrictions on immigration, just very few. So I think most open border folks would be happy saying that if you are a wanted violent criminal, that might exclude you from uh, immigrating. If you have some particularly deadly contagious disease and so forth. But other than that, uh, sort of ordinary peaceful migrants should be able to come to the United States. So as far as the, the argument goes, I think there are really two strands. One is just that the, the economic benefits of immigration are huge. So the most optimistic estimates say that we could potentially double world GDP by opening borders. So we've done a pretty good job uh, opening up trade. We've done a much worse job opening up borders. But in terms of the productivity gains, it, it would be incredible, better than anything else we could do. Uh, and this goes back to what I was discussing earlier with our obligations to the global poor. Foreign aid doesn't have a good track record. Military intervention doesn't have a good track record. But allowing people to move from places with low wages to higher wages is by far the best anti-poverty tool that we have. So if we were going to get into the nitty gritty of some of that, what do you actually have to do then to secure the borders? Right? Because that's really what this is about. So even if if you make every economic argument that I'm like, all right, I can't whittle my way out of that, yeah. but, right? Like if I'm on board that, you still have to do something to make sure that you're doing those things, making sure that murderers aren't right. coming in and all that. And we don't seem very good at that. Right. And I think maybe that's the leap that gets me to where I can't make the, the secondary part that you're talking about here. Yeah, so I'm not sure about the policy specifics. I mean, something like the old Ellis Island system seems pretty good. I mean, we had uh, a, a ton of immigration um, back then, but there still was some kind of uh, checking mechanism. So as far, so I doubt that that involves building a wall, um, but having some kind of uh, you know centralized location where immigrants can come and get documents and things like that seems seems pretty reasonable. Uh, but that's probably the most detail I could give you on policy ideas. Right. Yeah. So then when you go over these borders, then you're go you would want these people to be governed by the laws of the place that they were in, right. correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would be happy to, to write, uh, uh, allow ordinary peaceful migrants to come in uh, and then apply for U.S. citizenship. Just, you know, uh, make it pretty easy to do that. Right. Is so. this, though, a tough one for a guy that doesn't trust the government that much? Because that, that's what's ringing with yeah. me here. And when I've heard this argument, it's like, all right, wait, if you don't trust the government, yeah. well, then why do you think the government would be able to vet people properly, especially because we now see what's going on in Europe where they've vetted people very poorly and have had very porous borders? Yeah, so this might, yeah. So I, I don't know. I think, though, if you're a skeptic of the government, so presumably you're a free trade advocate, you like trade yeah. across borders, you wouldn't be happy with governments micromanaging trade across borders because you're a skeptic about how well the government works, as am I. And for the same sorts of reasons, I'm skeptical. So I think if you're worried about the government working well, that's all the more reason to get it out of the immigration regulation business. So it might, I think you're probably right, it does a bad job of a lot of stuff, almost yeah. everything. Um, and so the standard here is not going to be perfection, but just what's the best alternative, heavily regulated immigration or lightly immigrated regulation. And I think all things equal, lightly, lightly regulated immigration will probably be better. And let me give you another argument, too. So this, again, is maybe a more libertarian, classical liberal argument for uh, immigration, but it just seems like people have a right to, to move across borders. So, for example, if... Uh, you know, I don't know, uh, this table, for example, were divided by some kind of border. And I said, well, look, I want you to come over to my side and rent my house from me or work in my business or join my religious congregation. And you said, 
okay, I do want to do those things. And we both agree on this. We, we agree on the terms. And then the state sort of intervenes as a third party in this, um, what this philosopher Robert knows would call a capitalist act between consenting adults. It seems like they would be violating our rights to associate with one another mm -hmm. on free terms. And so I think there's a reason to think that uh, border controls violate people's natural rights. Is there also some inherent problem though that let's say most of the Western societies, the freest societies got on board this, well then they would end up being flooded with people where maybe the economics don't work out. Because if we just say, I mean, if you think about it, like if tomorrow we were just like, all right, everybody can come, and you yeah. just, as long as you're not a murderer or you know, drug dealer, you're good to go, that there must be some economic theory here where we're gonna let in a certain amount of people, your economics are gonna work out, and then we're gonna get to some odd tipping point where, because freedom's pretty good, and a lot yeah. of people are gonna want in on it. Yeah, so I think there are a couple things to say. So one is just if we, I, I think that problem to some extent would be self-correcting. So if you think that a lot of the pressure to migrate is economic, so people are moving from low-wage countries to higher-wage countries, well, as you had more and more people enter the high wage, higher wage countries, this would increase the total number of workers, which would probably start dropping down their wages, and so you would probably see less motivation to move, I think that's one thing. But as a, as a concession to this worry, what I would say is, well, we could do it slowly. So for example, if we're really worried about these um, effects of dramatically increasing immigration overnight, what we could do is just say, increase, say the limits on immigration by, I don't know, 10% every year or something like that, mm -hmm. and take it slowly and see where it goes. We wouldn't have to push the button, open the borders, overnight if we have this worry. Yeah, what do you think is ph philosophically the, the soundest way to deal with the people that are already here? Uh, I, yeah, so I am an advocate of the view that you don't have an obligation to obey unjust laws. And so I think that our immigration laws are unjust. So I think people who came here, uh, even against current immigration law, I think they should just, um, amnesty, full citizenship, that's, that would be my uh, approach to that. Huh. Yeah. All right, we're not quite there on well, that, but that, it's all good. Well, so, it's all yeah. good. That's what it's all about. Well, so yeah. let, me, let me ask you this. Yeah. So you're, I, it's a, you're not a fan of the drug war. No, I'm not okay. a fan of the drug war. So suppose we have somebody who, uh, I don't know, is in jail for selling marijuana or something yeah. like this. Um, and then suppose that, uh, yeah, so they're breaking. Who was a citizen of the United States. Who was States. a citizen of the United okay. States, but who broke, say, current immigration, or not immigration, current drug laws. Yeah. Uh, do you think that they violated some moral obligation that they had uh, not to break U.S. drug law? Or do you say, well, look, it was a bad law, so they didn't do anything wrong? Well, uh, well, partly I think it would depend on the specific offense. So, would, so whether they were using drugs or selling drugs, I would see a distinction there. So okay. if, if there's someone that, and there are people that are in jail for using drugs right now, for yeah. using pot, I, I think those, those laws are unjust, and I would want to do everything I could to reverse those laws and reverse the, the uh, prison system, the justice system, and all that. As far as the dealers, yeah, you can't, until, until we fix these laws and figure out what actually is fair and change some classifications on marijuana and a bunch of other things, uh, it's tough. I, I think it's tough. I don't think you can free drug dealers per se. Okay. Even though you're, yeah. you don't think they did something that should be against the law. The people that are doing the drugs, I think you have a right to do with your body as you see fit. But again, but again, if you break a law, you have to, like, I would change the laws is what right. I'm saying. But if you break a law, then you have to suffer the consequences okay. of that. So did, somebody, that, did that all yeah, work out? Yeah, yeah, well, but so I'm curious, I don't know, forgive me for yeah, pressing no, no. you on this. But so suppose you have a drug user who's convicted of, of this offense yeah. and they're, they're in jail. But suppose they can escape from prison yeah. harmlessly. Um, do you think they would be doing something morally wrong by escaping from prison? <laughs> all right, so this is a good little, all right, we're doing a little yeah, this philosophical is what I do. game I here. This is what you do. annoys my students. So this, no, this yeah. is great, I mean, this is what it's about, right? So okay, so you, let's say someone was smoking weed at yes. home Cops bust in, they're thrown in jail for three years. Mm -hmm. It's year two, and they're gonna pull a Shawshank and, and get out of there. Right. Do I think they're morally, the question is, do I think they're morally right for doing it, or can that be morally justified? Yeah, is, is that it the morally, question? so, right, so would we morally criticize them if, right, they pulled a Shawshank where they escaped through the wall or something like that, yeah. and they don't harm anyone, they just, they just leave, because they say, 
I was convicted of something that ought not be a crime, so I don't owe any morally, moral allegiance to that law, and so I'm just going to escape. Would you, yeah. if you hear about this story, do you say... I'd be rooting for that okay, guy. Okay, okay. Yeah, I would be rooting for that guy. So that's kind of my perspective on immigration, that I think that it's an unjust law, and so peop, just as people aren't under an obligation to obey the state with respect to the drug war, yeah. I don't think people are under an obligation to obey the state with respect to immigration. Right, so I guess our sort of disconnect on this is just the unjustness of immigration right. laws versus drug laws. Right. So, right. So if you think that the law itself is not unjust, then my argument won't have any kind of grip on you. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not saying our immigration laws are just, yeah. by the way. Um, I just think that especially now, uh, also just because of terrorism and people move, and just when you see what's going on with Europe and, and cause it hasn't just been, uh, people trying to get over for humanitarian purposes. There, We know that there's a lot of migrants and all sorts of other people, and then assimilation problems, and then welfare state problems. Like It just seems like it's become this massive thing that most of Europe would probably do it very differently if they could look back eight years ago, right? Yeah, so as far as the terrorism point goes, I mean, I think if somebody is is a wanted terrorist or a suspected terrorist, that's a perfectly legitimate reason not to not to allow them in. Uh, I'm, I'm less concerned about the, the assimilation concern, the welfare state concern. So as, as far as the, the assimilation worry goes, I mean, a lot of the, the evidence I've seen uh, suggest that the political values of immigrants, and especially second generation American immigrants, is almost identical to the political uh, political values held by uh, native born Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the wel welfare state concern goes, um, I would say we have lots of other freedoms that can potentially increase the cost of the welfare state, and we're okay with people exercising them. So for example, uh, you know, I don't know, we allow people to choose their own profession, for example, in the United States. And so suppose you have a student who says, uh, here's what I want to do with my life. I, I want to become a philosopher. You say, well, that's, you know, that's a <laughs> dicey career choice. Not a lot of money in it. Who knows, maybe you'll end up on unemployment. Yeah. And this will, in fact, increase the cost of the welfare state because now you have this person on unemployment because they chose to become a philosopher with their life. Um, we say, well, uh, we, we let them do that. We let them exercise that freedom to choose their occupation, even knowing that this might increase the costs of the welfare state. And so I think you can make an analogous argument about immigration. If you think it's a right and important human freedom, then you say, well, this is sort of the price of respecting rights and respecting freedom. They sometimes can impose costs on third parties. Yeah, so if all these people come here, then what, what duty does the state have to make sure that they don't just get here and can't do anything, and then then more crime comes and drugs and the rest of it. Yeah. Is there a responsibility for the state at that point? I, I'm not sure that the responsibility of the state to immigrants is different from their responsibility to citizens. So I think part, so, uh, I mean, there's also a question of what we would do in the ideal world versus the real world. So you say in the ideal world of somebody like Milton Friedman, the welfare state is much smaller. Maybe you have something like the negative income tax. This isn't the world we live in. We have over a trillion dollars of redistributive spending every year. I mean, I, I don't, so, so there are two separate issues. So one is this empirical claim about whether immigrants tend to consume more in government services than they pay in taxes. And it seems like the fiscal effect is pretty moderate. So some estimates say they do in fact raise fiscal costs a little bit. Others say, no, in fact, actually they're a net benefit because a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, new immigrants aren't, um, consuming a lot of government services and so forth, and they're paying sales tax and things like this. Um, but I think, the, again, this is like the, a concession. If you really have this worry about the welfare state, we could say, well, maybe this is not my view, but if, if, if this is what it took for me to get you over to my side, I'll, I'll, give you this, I'll give you this concession. We could say something like, you have a five-year waiting period before you have access to unemployment benefits and whatnot. I would take that over border closure if those are the only two options right. on the table. It's tough being intellectually honest, isn't it? Because you, you have to concede things That's every true. now and again, which you just don't see people doing anymore. So it seems like doubly... That's just, this is just a ploy to get you and your viewers to come <laughs> over to my side. So yeah, I, I don't care so much about the honesty. Just get people on the open border side. All right, so you've argued that inequality of income isn't the real issue, but poverty is the real issue. Right. Let's get into the weeds on that. Okay, good. So sometimes you'll hear, this is sometimes philosophers, but oftentimes politicians, they'll make statements like 2% of uh, American earners have 40% of the country's wealth or something like that. And from here, we're supposed to infer that some injustice has occurred because there's this, this large inequality. 
And I think, uh, I mean, there might be an injustice there, uh, but we can't tell strictly on the basis of the inequality. So there's a philosopher named Robert Nozick who famously said, what matters isn't so much the income distribution that we end up with, but how we got there. So if somebody has a huge amount of wealth, but they got it through theft or they got it through lobbying the government for special privileges, this is very bad. This is something that we shouldn't encourage. On the other hand, if we have somebody who has a lot of wealth because they invented the iPhone and there are tens if not hundreds of millions of people who want to buy this, that's totally fine. So we can't just look at the pie and how it's carved up and say whether it's just or unjust. Mm -hmm. We have to see, did people make their money by making other people better off, by giving them things that they wanted, or did they take it through fraudulent means, coercive means? And I think that the talk about inequality oftentimes confuses equality with poverty. Mm -hmm. So is what we're really concerned with equalizing income or are we concerned about making the poor better off? And I think it's the latter that we really should care about. So how do we go ahead and do that? Well, so opening borders, I think, is the first step in terms of alleviating global inequality, or I'm sorry, global poverty, I think, is the best thing that we can do. I think domestically, there are a lot of government policies that really do harm to, to the most disadvantaged groups. So I think opening up school choice would be a great idea. I think ending the drug war would be a great idea. I think ending occupational licensing would be a, a, a very good idea. So enabling people to uh, work in certain industries or start their own business uh, with a lot less red tape is a very good but idea. But then wouldn't barbers be stabbing people with scissors? I, no, I know. Well, this but, is what I say. There are some states where you have to uh, you have to get a license to shampoo people. Yeah. But I shampoo my I'm I, I'm taking you, this wait, huge what, risk. I doing, shampoo my hair every morning. You're doing it's, this unlike, on license? I know. It's I know, I, I probably shouldn't say that. On <laughs> yeah, to your viewers, I do. I shave yeah. myself. I you know comb my hair without a license, and so far the government hasn't come after me, and I haven't you know poked my eye out. Yeah. So, so what's your all right? So what's your best argument then when when the people that don't buy into this and say, well, we need these regulations because you're going to have people that don't know how to dye hair are going to be scalding people's heads, and right. you know, uh, Mr. Burns is going to be dumping <laughs> nuclear waste into the Springfield River and all of those things. Yeah. What's the best argument against that? Well, so one argument is just that I don't think regulation works very well, and I don't think so. I, I think the way that the public views regulation is probably misguided. So. I don't think that regulators are bad people, but I think if you examine the ways that regulations are formed and operate in the real world, it's oftentimes to protect the, in the interests of the industries that they're regulating. So this is what's known as regulatory capture, where regulators aren't always looking out for the public interest, they're actually looking out for the interest of people in that industry. So financial regulation is a case of this. You have lobbyists who might be friends with people in the financial sector. They wanna work in the financial sector later or vice versa. And so they're often very friendly to the very people that they're regulating. Um, and as far as you know, the, the worry about you know scalding people and so forth, um, I think that competition itself is a kind of regulation. So in the mm -hmm. case of, of school choice, it's true you might have very bad charter schools, for example. But again, the, the, the standard here is not perfection. The standard is what's the alternative. So we have public schools that are terrible. Yeah. But charter schools have this advantage of enabling people to choose. So if you go to a charter school that's failing, you can pull your kids out and put them somewhere else. And that's a kind of regulation in the sense that it provides incentives to the providers to supply good service. So it's almost like we should rely on self-regulation instead yeah. of or, or not, external not even, regulation. Yeah, not, not even self-regulation in the sense, so this is something that comes up when I, when I argue with people, is that they think that I have this view of private business uh, as, as being sort of benevolent, where they'll just take care of themselves out of a sense of the public interest. I think maybe to some extent that's true, but it's more the, the kind of Smithian insight, where if you have providers who are competing for my business, they don't have to care about my welfare directly or the welfare of my family, but they might just want my money. And that itself is an incentive for them to provide good, safe service. So in a sense, it's competition for dollars, competition for customers that acts as the regulation. So I think the market, as a whole is self-regulating or self-correcting. Yeah, so you're also a universal basic income supporter. Yeah. Now usually this is a, a idea that comes from economists on the left. Uh, I've heard some interesting sort of libertarian uh, arguments from it, uh, from people, but what is your take on this? So this goes back to the idea that it is important to take care of people who are in poverty or who might have fallen on hard luck and uh, need some help getting back on their feet. I, I, my, my short pitch for the universal basic income would just be, suppose you could take 
I forget what the number is, but you know, over a trillion dollars of redistributive spending that the United States government does, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment, all these things. Suppose we said, okay, you can remove all that and just get some kind of cash payout if you fall below a certain level of poverty. So this is kind of the Milton Friedman idea, uh, where you get sort of more and more money the further below the poverty line you are. So you can take the whole apparatus of the welfare state with its bureaucracy and inefficiency and just replace that with a universal basic income. I make that trade every day of the week. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think that that would disincentivize people to actually, the people that are right above that marker? I mean, do you know where you'd put that marker? Right. So I don't know, I don't have the specifics of where I would put it, but yeah. the, the idea is that we, uh, so the way that uh, uh, Friedman structured the idea of the uh, negative income tax is that you would still get more total income by working and making more money. So you would see some decrease in the cash grants that you get from the government, um, but it wouldn't be so massive as to disincentive. So they would be trimmed, but they wouldn't be trimmed so much that you have no incentive to, to go to work. Yeah, do you see that as just like some sort of inconsistency with the way that you generally view government? Because like, you're obviously not a big government guy, right. and yet this is something that's really, like I would view this as something that this is like government should have no place in giving that much to people. Like it's kind of shitty, like I'd love to figure out better ways to help people who need it the most. Um, but the idea of giving more, I just don't know that there's evidence that it works. Yeah, so there. So, so I think though that if that objection is successful, it would also be successful about uh, against something like private charity, for example. So I think there always is this worry that um, when you give some kind of assistance, that this will have negative effects on people's incentives to work. I think that's I think that's probably true to some extent, but that might just be a cost that we have to live with. So I think again, even if you're doing some sort of private charity. Uh, that might lessen at the margin people's willingness to go to work. But I think that trade-off is worth it if it means, say, that uh, we have people who uh, aren't starving, who aren't uh, very sick without help. But I do, I, so again, a concession that I will make, because I think, by and large, private charity will work much better than sort of state bureaucratic charity. Yeah. Um, or, or transfer programs. At, at some philosophical level, doesn't that also make people feel better? Like the idea that like right now the government just does things and it either does them inefficiently or not and you don't really know where your money's going and you kind of just are like, you can just easily be like, yeah, I'm for poor people because the government's doing it. Right. Where when you actually go ahead and do things and go ahead and volunteer and go ahead and give charity and all that, that just philosophically, for your own goodness and happiness and things that we've talked about, that that's probably much more rewarding. I think so. Uh, right. It's very it's very easy and low cost to just cast a vote for some policy or politician that happens to align with your values. That doesn't really you know the price of that is very low. But right, actually, say doing some research, figuring out what causes you support, uh, putting money to those things. Right. I think that's much more gratifying. I think you should get more moral credit for doing that than yeah. uh, just voting for policies that you like too. Is that sort of the basic discussion? connect between Democrats and Republicans at this point? Like I view it as sort of Democrats are kind of like, we'll just do everything for you. We're gonna say all the nice things and do it for you. And Republicans are just like, we're not, we, well, they end up doing it anyway, because they, right. once they're in power, they're always spending the money anyway, but they seem like the evil guys because they don't want to do it, and then they do it anyway. But that, that's what it really comes down to. It's like one set of people who are saying we're gonna do all the nice things, and then doing them even when the results aren't nice, and another set who doesn't, who don't say they want to do the nice things, but then they end up doing it, and the results still aren't great. Yeah, well, so, so I'm not sure, although I, I do remember this book, I, it's probably a little old by now, uh, called Who Really Cares by Arthur Brooks. Have you, have you ever come across no, that? No. So he's, uh, I think now he's the president of the of AI, AI think, yeah. right. And what he, he did find that there were differences in charitable giving between Democrats and, and Republicans, or I'm not sure if it was along party lines or ideological lines more broadly. And he did find evidence that uh, conservatives tend to give more privately than Democrats. Uh, there might be a variety of explanations for that. So one explanation might just be that conservatives tend to be more skeptical of this, the efficacy of these large scale bureaucracies, like how well do they actually work? I think there's maybe also this, this idea that it's the role of something like the family or the church or civil society to take care of people who are in poverty rather than the states. And so maybe that's why you see 
conservatives giving more charitable dollars than um, people on the left. Yeah. All right, so I want to finish up with a couple uh, scientific experiments okay. that you've you've written about. Oh wow! I got okay. a couple here. All right, let's see how how sharp you are on the previous work you've done. All right, talk to me about the Stanford Prison experiment. Oh okay, yeah. So oh man, that's yeah, that's going back. Yeah. Right. So this was uh, this was I do research around here. I, I, no, I don't I'm just impressed. sit down with people and you know. I think you know my work better than I do yeah. at this point. <laughs> So that was an experiment that was conducted, I, I want to say in the early 70s, by a, a Stanford psychologist. And he recruited uh, more or less ordinary young men to serve in this experiment. And uh, some of the subjects were cast as prisoners in this fake prison. And other uh, subjects were cast as the prison guards in this experiment. And so they were enforcing the prison rules and feeding the prisoners and uh, having them go to sleep at specified times and so forth. And to make a long story short, what he found was that the power given to the students who were the prison guards did have this corrupting effect. So this idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely mm -hmm. um, seemed to be supported by his experiment. So very quickly, I think in a matter of days, what you found were the guards who, were, again, were drawn from the same demographic pool as the, as the prisoners, were abusing the prisoners, were mocking them. Uh, and he had to cut it short because essentially the wheels came off of this experiment and the, the prisoners got so abusive, er, the prison guards got so abusive. And so this, I think, confirms this idea that uh, you don't have to be a bad person to allow power to have this corrupting effect on your behavior. Yeah, there must be plenty of other studies proving that, right? Even through just the prison system. I mean, I feel like every prison movie I've ever right. watched are Orange is the New Black. I mean, the people that are in charge of the prisons usually are pretty bad people. Yeah, yeah, and, and like I said, they could be perfectly but, ordinary. And there's also the, the Milgram experiments, were, which are kind of the, uh, the classic case of this, where you just have people who are, in essence, willing to torture, give electric shocks to complete strangers because somebody in authority told them to do so. And the subjects figure out ways to rationalize why these electric shocks are justified. You know, the person should have um, behaved differently and they wouldn't have gotten the shocks. And what's really frightening about this is it does show that ordinary people, people like uh, you know, you and I could easily see our behavior corrupted given the right sort of institutions. Yeah, what do you do as, as a human knowing that? What do you do to, to insulate yourself? Yeah, from that? well, so one thing I think is to be very skeptical of these sorts of institutions which give people lots of power over others. I think that's one of the big picture um, lessons from these sorts of exper uh, experiments is just be wary of, of giving people power. On an individual level, knowing about it, I think helps a little bit, but even more than just knowing about it, I think um, practicing it. So when you know that you're in a position, say, to do something wrong because you feel the social pressure to do it, uh, uh, on a small level, um, just try to resist that impulse and actually do the right thing. So I don't think it's the sort of thing that you can condition yourself to do overnight to resist malevolent authority or resist becoming a malevolent authority. But you could take small steps. You kinda, it's like practicing an athletic skill or something like that. You don't try dunking a basketball the first time you pick it up, but you take these small incremental steps and you get better and better. Hopefully you build character traits um, and then maybe resist it when the situation becomes more dire. It's interesting because that sort of reminds me of the way that we see virtue signaling happening on social media these days. It's not that we're all deciding we have this power and we can shock somebody, but it's like you find someone halfway across the world who says something you slightly disagree with, right. even though you've never heard of them before, you start seeing the mob go at them, and then next thing you know, you ratchet up more, and then someone else ratchets it up more right. and ratchet it up more, and it's all done in the name of being good, actually, right. the way you're trying to shame and destroy this person. Yeah, they're, and they're right, there's something kind of psychologically gratifying about being part of a moralizing mob, and I think that's an impulse that, that does have to be resisted. Right, so it's virtue signaling, it's not actual it's, it's not virtue. It's not actual virtue. Right, exactly. Actual virtue would be saying something like, well, I, I, you know, I think everybody here is wrong about what the right thing to do is here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a usually a pretty lonely guy. <laughs> that's true, that's true. All right, one more. Sure. The ash conformity experiment. Yeah, so that's along the same line as the Stanford Prison Experiments and the Milgram Experiments. In this, I think this was the one of the originals. It was in the 1950s, and uh, subjects were given uh, a board which had lines of different lengths on them. So, like there was one that was very long, one that was moderately long, one that was short, for example. Uh, and then they were given another line 
that they were told uh, was the same length as one of the lines on the other board. And it was very obvious. So it was like, this was a, like a, a very long line over here, and there was a very long line over here. They were clearly the same length, but they were surrounded by other lines of various length. But it was just this very easy test. And so they asked subjects, well, which line over here is the same length as this line over here? And everybody knew what the correct answer was. But the twist of the experiment was uh, the experimenter would bring in confederates who would lie and give the obviously false answer. So they would say, uh, oh, in fact, it turns out that this short line over here is the same length as this long line over here. And what they wanted to test was whether the genuine subject would conform to the mistaken group judgment, which they knew to be clearly wrong, or would they stick to their guns and say, no, everybody in this room is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's clearly you know, this line here and everybody else made a mistake. And the depressing result is that many people uh, would not just conform once, but would conform over and over again to the judgment that they knew was wrong. And even people who sometimes broke from the group would have at least a couple of answers where they conformed to the group answer. So is that just sort of basic built-in DNA that just certain people are gonna stand up for what they believe and what's right and what's true and, and just most of us aren't? Or is that, can you, can you really? Know. I don't know. You, they, Get to I, that I don't know. That's a good like Stephen Pinker question. That's it. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Right, right, right. I, I well, like, I believe Pinker would say something about a blank slate. Yeah, right. right. So, so I'm not sure. Right. He might. He might say it's uh, something close to our DNA. I'm not sure. It's interesting when you read testimony from people in the Milgram experiments. There were some people who just refused to deliver these shocks to people, even though there was a lot of pressure on them. And it seems like some of them had life experiences that really discouraged them from. Uh, obeying the authority. And it wouldn't shock me, no pun intended, if there was something like that going on in these conformity experiments where maybe people have seen the malevolent effects of blind conformity and, and this motivated them to do it. Uh, so yeah, so I'm not sure whether it's nature or nurture, I don't know, that's probably above my pay grade. Right, yeah. so all right, as long as you mention Pinker, this yeah. I think will be a good way to wrap this all okay. up. Are you hopeful, as, as a philosopher, are you hopeful for free thought? I mean, a, a lot of people that, care about the conversations that we're having are really worried. And I find that the people that I'm most closely associated with, that I have these conversations with most, I would say most of us are sort of world weary optimists. That's how I would describe yeah. myself. Like if I wasn't hopeful, I don't know how the hell I could do this every day, right? Like yeah. I'm hopeful that we can make things better. And yet at the same time, there's no doubt we have an uphill battle and that there's you know so much hysteria all the time and all the, the forces that, that we're not into seem to be on the march all the time, but are, are you hopeful? I, I like that term world weary optimist. I think that probably describes me pretty well. And part of the reason I'm optimistic is because oftentimes when, I think when you're interacting with people on a one-on-one -on -one level, you're, you're more likely to have a civil productive discussion about controversial topics than when it's like these huge, like I, you just gave this talk, I think recently at a college and you got, <laughs> Heck, you could probably, you could probably give me an hour of yeah, philosophical that's right, that's right. <laughs> beat down on um, that at no. University of New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, and so I think in those, so talking about like virtue signaling and a mob mentality, I think those sorts of settings are conducive to that. I think oftentimes when you're just talking with a person over a beer, you might have completely different politics than they do, but it's kind of a, a non-threatening sort of friendly situation. I think people's guards go down a little bit uh, more in those sorts of situations and you can actually have a, a conversation about controversial topics in good faith. And so that, I, so I think people want that. I think people uh, want to have these kinds of discussions and yeah. arguments. Um, and it might be the people who are uh, least friendly to that sort of thing uh, get the most visibility or get the most publicity. But I think you know if you took an average person off the street and you said, "Hey, let's grab a beer and talk about politics," it wouldn't be nearly as bad as you know uh, doing it in front of fifty thousand people. I agree, and that's why I said the thing about the eighty percent before. And I think in summation, you believe that beer is the great philosophical equalizer. Maybe bourbon. I'm not really. Oh, yeah, you're, not more, really you're more. You're more. Yeah, no, not beer. There's yeah, no. I, you've got this great thing over here. So yeah. So bourbon is bourbon whiskey. That yeah. On that note, we should wrap this up and right. see what we can do with the bourbon. All right, for more on Chris, check out cfryman.com, which we'll link to right down below.